Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to the September webinar of the International Society of Radiation Epidemiology and Dosimetry. Um, today's webinar will be about um, the effects of ionizing radiation on the cardiovascular system. And we have uh, five colleagues from the French Institute of Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety speaking today, which I will introduce very shortly. My name is George Dentas, and I'm a medical physicist at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital in London, and also a researcher at the Late Effects Group of, at the University of Oxford. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping uh, points. Uh, the presentation is being recorded, so you can um, um, you, you should know that, and also you can ask your colleagues to, to watch it if they want to. Um, and also, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can uh, just I write them on the chat and then I will try to make sure that we answer as many as possible. So um, the first uh, speaker today is Dr. Laurent, from, uh, who is the head of uh, the epidemiology laboratory of the Institute, and who will gonna give us a short description of the research activities of the Institute. Thank you, Giorgio. So I cut my camera because I want to, to stay with you. So um, it's my pleasure to give you an overview. Oh, sorry, I've forgotten to share my screen. Uh, this one, I think. Okay. Very good. Okay, sure. sure. So it's my pleasure to give you an overview of uh, our activities in epidemiology at uh, IRSN. So first of all, uh, a few words about IRSN. So it's uh, the French public expert on nuclear and radiologic, radiological risks with three areas of uh, expertise, protection of the human population and uh, the environment, nuclear safety and uh, security. So today, uh, the labs whose activities will be presented are in uh, Fontenay-Rose, a uh, few kilometers south, uh, south of Paris. Uh, now, if, you if we focus on uh, the epidemiology lab, we can say that we are very lucky at RSN because we can benefit from the expertise of several teams, the research department in dosimetry, with whom an example of collaboration will be presented just after, with David, the radiology uh, radiotoxicology and radiobiology laboratories, the radiation protection expertise department, very important for us because they maintain the national registry for the surveillance of radiation workers. So it's very important for our study on uh, nuclear workers, for example. And uh, we also uh, work uh, with the, the environment uh, division, uh, uh, mainly uh, for radon related uh, projects. So today uh, we are nine tenured epidemiologists and one biostatistician. We welcome early career researchers, of course, uh, either PhD students, postdoctoral fellows or master students. And we also work with external collaborators, mainly for data management activities. And uh, the laboratory was, was headed for a long time by Margot Tiermarche and uh, Dominique Laurier, uh, whom some of, you, some of you know very well. So our activities cover uh, three types of population, the workers, the patients, and the, the public. Today, we have a very large and complex data sets, uh, which we require, of course, uh, data management activity under the supervision of the, our two data managers. And uh, we also develop, develop uh, advanced statistical modeling to take account, for example, of uh, measurement errors, dosimetric uncertainties, uh, multi-exposure situation or competitive risk. And this area of research is uh, developed by, by our uh, biostatistician. So if we come uh, to the study, the historical, if I can say, studies of the lab are the studies on the nuclear, the nuclear workers. So three major uh, courts have been uh, set up to cover different stages of the uranium cycle in France. So from uh, mining to uh, power production. So we have a court on um, uranium miners, 
a court on uh, nuclear workers mostly exposed to external gamma rays and uh, monitored with individual dosimeters. And uh, the youngest court is the Tracy court of uh, uranium processing workers with data on uh, the external occupational exposure to ionizing radiation, but also uh, we calculate for each worker uh, is um, uranium incorporated doses using biokinetic and dosimetry models. Uh, in fact, for the three court, we have uh, reconstructed the individual dosimetry uh, along the career of each worker. But uh, for the Tracy court, we have uh, further information on other occupational uh, hazard risks by uh, constructing uh, job exposure matrix for each company included in the, in the study. And we also retrieve information from uh, the occupational medical file on smoking, body max index, uh, so such kind of information. So uh, these three courts um, include between uh, a few thousand to uh, several tens of thousands of workers uh, followed up for now uh, 25 or 30 years on average. Um, and uh, these three cohorts partic are participating to international uh, studies, so uh, Puma for the uranium mi miners, uh, Inworks for the nuclear worker cohort, and uh, Tracy is participating to a new uh, international uh, study on uh, uranium processing workers uh, that is uh, named uh, IPO. Uh, and, uh, that is um, uh, a collaboration between uh, the United States, uh, Europe, and Canada. So uh, we are also interested in other uh, categories of workers with a new cohort on, uh, med on radiation medical workers, uh, which is called ORICAMS. It's a mortality follow-up of uh, 200,000 workers in the radiology, nuclear medicine, and the radiotherapy sectors. Unfortunately, we are not able to reconstruct the individual uh, exposure to ionizing radiation for the whole cohort, by, but we plan to develop uh, case control studies in this large cohort. And the first one will be on brain cancer among medical staff. And um, this study uh, will be uh, set up uh, in the frame of a collaboration between the NCI and the Korea University in Seoul. And the, the youngest cohort, we are very at the first step of implementation, uh, is a cohort of uh, flight attendants in France called SPACE. The lab has also developed uh, uh, several studies uh, on patients. So um, uh, first on patients uh, who receive uh, diagnostic exposure to ionizing radiation. So we have two cohorts uh, which, which focus on cancer risks um, associated to exposure due to either uh, CT scan for the enfant scanner cohort or to cardiac catheterization procedure uh, for the coccinelle cohort. So the enfant scanner cohort includes uh, 100,000 children uh, and uh, they are followed up for uh, the cancer incidence uh, uh, with a special focus on brain tumors, leukemia, and lymphoma. The doses are reconstructed for each child and uh, this cohort uh, is, is participating to the large Euro European EPCT court with near 1 million children and also to the Medirad project. And the coccinelle court is uh, youngest. The first analyses are being uh, in process uh, uh, at the lab and uh, the first result will be available um, next year, uh, we hope. And uh, Coccinelle participates to the Harmonic project, which was presented um, uh, by Isabel thierry uh, in the June um, session of uh, ISO-RED conference. Uh, we have also activities on the um, therapeutic exposures to patients. 
So the first uh, study will be presented just after by Sophie, so uh, I won't detail uh, it. The second study is EpiBrainRAD, and um, uh, it aims at uh, assessing the incidence of radiation-induced neurological toxicity in patients treated for uh, high-grade glioma. Uh, so it's a cohort of 200 uh, patients and the evaluation of the neurotoxicity of uh, radiotherapy uh, relies on neuropsychological assessment, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, radiobiology, and detailed dosimetry for each uh, patient. And uh, recently, we, were, uh, we received the funding from the uh, National Agency um, uh, for Research in France uh, for a new project uh, called uh, RadioEd, uh, which aims at developing spatiotemporal uh, probabilistic models and machine learning algorithms to perform automated processing of brain MRI data in order to predict uh, individual cognitive impairment at an early stage in the court EpiBrainRAD. And uh, we have a third uh, recent study uh, that uh, was just uh, was uh, set up a few months ago. It's uh, the START uh, study, which aims at uh, studying the toxicity of uh, radio iodine uh, in the frame of a treatment for a thyroid cancer uh, for adult patients. So the patients, uh, uh, the, um, the impact on the quality of life uh, of patients is assessed thanks to questionnaires on the, uh, that are proposed before and after the treatment to the patient. But we have also saliva samples that will allow to study the um, uh, radiosensitivity biomarkers. And uh, we have also a work done on the dosimetry, which is uh, also a collaboration with David um, in a, in a in this study, uh, dosimeters are placed on the skin in front of the salivary gland. So uh, uh, David will be uh, able to reconstruct the, dosimet the precise dosimetry um, to the patients. So um, we have few studies, few own studies uh, regarding the general population uh, at uh, the lab at RSN, but we have a new uh, project that uh, will fill uh, um, partly uh, this gap. Uh, it's the CORAL project, and um, it, it is based on an existing uh, court uh, in France, which is uh, called Constance, and uh, Constance is a general proposed population-based cohort of 200,000 adults, uh, which are proposed every year, very detailed questionnaire on uh, their way of life and their exposures. Um, and uh, so uh, Constance, uh, uh, it's possible to work on a large um, uh, sample of uh, types of exposure. Uh, there is also Biobank, and the aims of the project we propose is to reconstruct the radiological radio exposure of a sample of uh, participants of Constance since birth, so for the lifelong. And uh, so we will reconstruct uh, radon, terrestrial and cosmic uh, radiation, medical diagnostic radiation and occupational radiation. And uh, of course, the aim is to study association between cancer and non-cancer uh, diseases uh, and exposure to ionizing radiation. But uh, this project uh, will also make it possible to study interaction with other kinds of uh, hazards, for example, uh, uh, pollution or uh, chemical exposures. And uh, we, um, among other activities, uh, we also contribute to the GeoCAP study, which is conducted by the uh, National um, Institute for Research, uh, Medical Research and Health in CERM, on the risk of pediatric, pediatric cancer associated with environmental factors. Uh, we also work on quantitative studies of radon risk uh, in France, and uh, we recently contributed to the IARC work on cancers attributable to lifestyle and uh, environmental factors in France. Uh, 
uh, it was a few years ago. And finally, we also participate in uh, working groups on the preparation of post-accidental uh, epidemiology. So that's it. I have uh, finished with the epidemiology activities, but uh, before I give the floor back, uh, I would uh, just like to give a very brief overview of the research activities of the Experimental Radiotoxicology and Radiobiology Research Laboratory at IRSN. So this lab is uh, headed by Dimitri Klokov, and Virginie, who will present uh, later in this seminar, is one of the researchers. So the, this uh, team uh, is in, interested uh, uh, in a large panel of, uh, of outcomes. So uh, the different topics uh, of research cover non-cancer effects on the cardiovascular system, either due to low doses or high doses. Uh, the researcher also developed project on the non-cancer effect of the brain either due to exposure due to CT scan or uh, higher exposure due to radiotherapy, or even, uh, for example, in workers uh, with um, effect due to inhalation of uh, microparticles uh, on the brain via the olfactory nerve. Uh, they are also interested in transgenerational effects, uh, studying uh, effect on the reproductive system, cardiovascular system, and the CNS on of uh, several um, generation of mice. And uh, they also have a project on cancer effects, especially on the kidney cancer uh, in association with the uh, uranium exposure. And um, they also develop projects on the colon cancer uh, in association with the low dose rates uh, exposure. And um, a new project uh, that are being developed are uh, to develop, sorry, <laughs> uh, AOPs for different outcomes, uh, for example, brain, uh, using tools as a mach machine learning, neural networks, Bayesian statistics, etc. So a very rich program uh, of research. So I thank you for your attention and I would like to thank also our uh, students, PhD students, uh, postdoc post fellows and also uh, our external collaborators uh, who help us to, uh, to carry on uh, all of these projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Leroy. Um, that's very interesting presentation, such a nice range of research activities you have at your institute. Um, I just a quick question I was wondering, especially for the international audience, if, uh, if somebody doesn't speak professional French, could, could they still apply to, to do some research at your institution or would that be a sort of a requirement, you think? No, it's possible. And as you can uh, observe, uh, my English is perfect, so no problem for me uh, to... <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to, to make sure that uh, that's not the case. No, no, it's possible. It's possible, uh, and uh, it's it's uh, the case. Uh, we sometimes receive uh, either uh, students or uh, visit visiting scientists from other countries. Great. Right. Th thank you very much. Um, I think we can we can move to to the next uh, presentation on cardiac toxicity after radiotherapy for breast cancer and see some results from epidemiological studies from Dr. Jacob and Dr. Locke. Uh, they are both postdoctoral fellows at the Institute. So uh, please, Dr. Um, Jacob. Thank you, George. Hello, everybody. And thank you uh, to ISRA to give us the opportunity to, to do this presentation. So we will speak about cardiac toxicity after radiotherapy for breast cancer and the uh, results from epi epidemiological study. Uh, in the presentation, I will very briefly give you the context of the studies and we will present two ongoing studies that we are performing at IRSN. Uh, the first one, Bakara study, will be presented by Medea Loke, who is a, a postdoctorate in our laboratory, which deals on early cardiotoxicity. And the second project is um, treat, uh, we are working on cardiac uh, arrhythmia. So briefly, um, it is known that uh, mediastinal radiotherapy 
and in particular breast cancer radiotherapy, can induce uh, cardiotoxicity. This is um, uh, the reason uh, for that is uh, because uh, during the treatment, the radiation beam can in, uh, induce a heart uh, exposure. And this cardiotoxicity represents a wide spectrum of uh, cardiac pathologies. And uh, among these pathologies, um, the coronary events were more uh, precisely investigated and the dose response relationship was observed with um, a 7.4% increase of the risk of uh, coronary events per additional gray of uh, uh, radiation exposure to the mean heart dose. And um, radiation-related heart disease usually present 10 to 15 or even more years after exposure. However, non-symptomatic abnormalities may also develop much earlier. And in this context of early cardiotoxicity, some studies have used the echocardiographic strain imaging for the detection of subclinical myocardial dysfunction. And they could observe some dysfunction less than two or three years after breast cancer radiotherapy. This was in particular observed in this study performed by Erben, where he evaluated the global longitudinal strain before radiotherapy and at different uh, point of follow-up until 40 months. And they always observed a significantly decreased GLS compared to the baseline value. But Finally, there are no only limited data on a specific event, which is the decrease of the GLS of more than 10 to 15 percent, which is known to be a predictive factor of clinically significant cardiotoxicity. So this is the first point we were interested in. Another part is on coronary arteries. It is known that during breast cancer radiotherapy, there is cardiac exposure, but it is very heterogeneous. And we also know that the highest doses are absorbed by the left anterior descending coronary artery. And in terms of cardiac imaging, it is interesting, the, the examination that is interesting for coronary arteries is the computed tomography coronary angiography, which allows detection and evolution of plaques and stenosis along the coronary arteries. And finally, the CTC has the potential to detect the early onset or progression of early coronary changes due to cardiac exposure. And it would be very interesting to combine this kind of uh, cardiac examination with a very precise dosimetry on coronary arteries. And in this specific field, there are no or very limited data. So in this context, we developed the study Baccarat that is now going to be presented by Medea. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, yes, as is described by Sophie, to quickly detect subclinical cardiac changes is of primary importance. Therefore, the French core a study named Bacara has been launched in 2015 to bring new highlights on the question included women with breast cancer without metastasis and chemotherapy free. The figure below showed the course of the study in brief biomarkers, echocardiography, CTCA uh, were collected before the radiotherapy. And further, per more, performed after radiotherapy at the six month and the 24 months follow-up times. As a result, more than 100 patients were, were included with a mean age of 58 years old and a prevalence of more than 80% of left-sided breast cancer. Regarding ECODATA, as Sophie mentioned before, GLS was considered because of having higher sensitivity and a better prognosis value than uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. Nearly 50% of the sample show, showed a restriction of the GLS superior to 10%. The first table here showed that there was a significant evolution of GLS in the whole sample between baseline and the six month follow up. Uh, but you can see that the evolution remained uh, significant only in patients with left-sided breast cancer. Regarding the dosimetry data, we can see that mean doses received in the left ventricle and in the whole heart were by different, uh, very different 
uh, in function of um, um, of the group left-sided breast cancer uh, patient or right-sided breast cancer patient. When we furthermore uh, focused on the dose-response relationship, we can first see in the figure on the left that there was significantly higher dose received on the whole heart and the left ventricle in patients presenting a restricted GLS. Furthermore, an 11 person increased risk of presenting um, an alteration, a restriction of the GLS uh, was observed per each additional grade of the left ventricle. In conclusion, the six month follow up analysis suggested a significant association between the dose received uh, during uh, the, the radiotherapy protocol and subclinical cardiac dysfunction. Our study also demonstrated the importance to assess a, a clinical event which is more uh, relevant than uh, a mean decrease of GLS. The importance of substructure uh, cardiac dosimetry was also highlighted here uh, with the, the, the significant uh, impact and the significant results um, at the left ventricle. Further analysis are also planned um, for, uh, for example, the 24 months analysis to investigate, uh, in fact, if GLS restriction will persist over time at a, a longer uh, uh, point of view, as well as um, CTCN and uh, biomarkers that. Finally, uh, even if the Bacahaus study brings uh, uh, really important and uh, new highlights on the topics, the study was limited by its potential uh, lack of statistical power. Therefore, uh, you can see that um, we uh, have launched uh, with um, five other research centers, the European Media Heart Early Heart Study. Um, the protocol is quite similar to the one of the Baccarat Court, but more than uh, 20, uh, 200, sorry, 250 patients have been included. Indeed, uh, epidemiological data are of primary importance to better characterize cardiotoxicity following radiotherapy. And um, Sophie will present you now another really in interesting uh, study in the field. Thank you, Radia. So now we'll speak about another type of uh, cardiac disease. Uh, it's arrhythmia and conduction disorders that are con considered as potential cardiac complications of breast cancer radiotherapy, but there are limited data for uh, severe cases of uh, arrhythmia that are requiring pacemaker implantation. So in this context, with um, a PhD student, Yassir Raman, we, um, we launched a study to evaluate the risk of pacemaker implantation for breast cancer patients treated with radiotherapy and compare this population with the general population and with uh, breast cancer patients not treated with radiotherapy. So we performed the, stu the study on the representative sample of the French healthcare database. We included adult women with the first breast cancer treated with or without radiotherapy between 2008 and 2016. We followed them until 2018, and we, in this cohort, we identified de novo pacemaker implantation. For statistical analysis, we performed standardized incidence ratio and competing risk survival analysis. For the results, we included in the cohort nearly 4,000 uh, breast cancer uh, patients. Three quarters of them were treated with radiotherapy. And in this group, we uh, observed 28 cases of pacemaker implantation. And we compared this number with the number of expected cases of pacemaker based on general population incidence rates. This was nearly 13. This yielded to a SIR of more than two, which was significant, which means that there was a higher incidence of pacemaker implantation in the group 
of patients treated with radiotherapy compared to general population. But when we look at the subpopulation of breast cancer patients without radiotherapy, the difference was uh, there was no difference in terms of pacemaker implantation between the group exposed uh, without radiotherapy compared to general what we could observe in general population. Then we do the comparison between the group of patients treated with or without radiotherapy. In terms of cumulative incidence, we could observe that the curve for the group treated with radiotherapy was always higher than in the group without radiotherapy. And in the survival analysis, um, we evaluated the hazard ratio and observed the hazard ratio sorry, of two, but this result was only borderline significant. So to conclude for this study, at the moment of also last decade in France, we can say that breast cancer patients treated with radiotherapy appear to be at higher risk of pacemaker than the general population. But further investigation remains necessary to identify high risk patient profile in terms of radiotherapy treatment or other treatment and cardiovascular background, etc. And for this, we need to work on larger cohorts. We need to collect information on background cardiovascular risk factor. And also we would need to collect information on cardiac dosimetry. And what would be interesting is to have information on the dose absorbed to the atrium or even to the sinus or atrioventricular nose because they are the bed of the conduction disease. So the general conclusion, um, as you can see, uh, there is a wide spectrum of cardiac pathologies with late effects or sometimes earlier effects, but there is still a need to develop knowledge. First question would be finally, which early cardiac imaging markers could help to predict later cardiac complications? A second point is to develop knowledge on the dose-response relationship. And for this, this is really a challenge for cardiac dosimetry, in particular for small cardiac substructure. And David Projo will give you further details on that. And last point is to the, on the understanding of uh, biological and molecular mechanisms that are underlying the pathogenesis of radiation-induced cardiovascular disease. So this is also a challenge for molecular mechanisms that will be presented with, uh, by Virginie Monceau on the cardiac conduction disease. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Jacob and Dr. Lockyer. Um, we have one question already in the chat, uh, which is, what was the lowest radiation dose to the heart you start seeing cardiac toxicity? Yes, um, I think I, I, um, I will ask Sophie to help me on this question. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, we, we can't say that uh, Bakara will um, give precise information on the possible result for um, cardiac, um, cardiac disease after exposure. That would be wonderful, but unfortunately it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not possible. So we, um, it's, it's difficult to answer. Bacar was not designed in terms of size and their own uh, estimation of those to, to answer clearly to this question. But uh, clearly we observe most, uh, most patients on the left with left-sided breast cancer at the, uh, at the, the event, um, but it is also the population who receives the highest, uh, highest dose to the, to the earth, but I can't provide a precise result for that. I would like that, not yet. Thank you. Um, what I noticed was that the left ventricular doses were quite high uh, for what I'm used to usually for breast cancer. I was wondering, were those patients treated with tangential breast radiotherapy or was it some of them with IMC or VMAT, which usually leads to, to higher left ventricular dose? No, it was only 3D CRT. 3D and just a tangential beams um, without IMC extra fields that could potentially. No, no. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and did you see any left ventricular ejection fraction changes? No. No. As I, as I, um, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, in fact, uh, we, we have seen in the literature that um, GLS uh, could be uh, uh, 
uh, more uh, more relevant uh, in a clinical point of view and uh, uh, than uh, L LVF. Thank you. Um, we have another question, which is about cardiac substructure dosimetry. So I think I will leave that for to be answered by Dr. Brogio, who is going to be presenting on that exact topic. Um, and then there is a comment that flash or proton radiotherapy might play a future role um, on reducing those uh, doses and, and perhaps toxicities, which... Um, yeah, interesting, yeah. Yes. Um, so th thank you both very much. And thank you I introduce... Much. Um, Dr. Brogio, who is the head of the symmetry uh, of the laboratory, and who is going to talk about cardiac substructure dosimetry with numerical model or patient-specific data. Yes, thank you, Giorgio, for this introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you, you are, ladies and gentlemen. As announced, I will uh, speak about uh, cardiac substructure dosimetry with a numerical model or patient-specific data. So I will give a very short uh, introduction for the background and then I will present uh, cardiac dosimetry uh, with numerical models or uh, direct cardiac dosimetry with the treatment planning system. And in both cases, I will show the method and I will present a, a few results. So as a background, uh, I think the most important point is to, uh, to know that during breast radiotherapy, the heart is in a steep dose gradient. Uh, you can have a very small portion of the heart with high dose around 30 grays and the vast majority of the heart with doses around 0.5 gray. And thus we think that uh, if one wants to establish a dose effect relationship for cardiac substructure, or at least understand what is happening, we think that it is certainly better to assess the most accurate doses to the substructure of interest. Because if we use global dose estimate, uh, like the mean heart dose, you can find correlation, but uh, the effect will not be really explained by uh, this correlation and this dose. If you want to perform cardiac uh, substructure dosimetry, like uh, coronary arteries or ventricles, you can use several contouring atlases that have been developed. I've, I have shown here a few examples. And what is very good with these uh, atlases, it, is, uh, it has been shown that they reduce inter-observer variability during contouring, which is very good for harmonization of uh, those studies. But they are based on average anatomy. It is not really uh, the anatomy of the patient. Um, whatever, uh, we think that doses should be evaluated with the treatment planning software to fit clinical needs to use the same tools uh, used in the radiotherapy department, as this is uh, what is uh, offered by cardiac atlases, and this is also the approach that we have adopted. So first, I would like to um, speak about cardiac dosimetry with numerical models. So, uh, with this method, we start with uh, CT images and contours as provided by the radiotherapy department. And we use these contours to build uh, 3D models in a specialized software used for the design purpose. It is what we call NERVs or mesh models. And in the patient model, we can, at this stage, include 
a numerical model, for example, the heart with the, all the coronaries. You can see this model as a 3D uh, atlas of the heart, or you can use a patient specific uh, contours obtained from uh, coronary computed tomography angiography. Once you have your 3D models, you can go back uh, to the TPS, creating a new DICOM sets. And at this stage, as shown here, you have included in your model the coronavirus. So I must admit this is quite a complex pipeline uh, to perform dosimetry. And we developed uh, initially this pipeline about uh, eight years ago, because at that time we were working with 3D models for those purposes, and we were quite at ease with them. But this is not the only reason, because with such a pipeline, you can also uh, carry out sensitivity studies. I will show an example. So uh, a first result that we have obtained with this um, pipeline, we have included the same detailed art model in several patient thoraxes, and we have calculated the doses for conformal breast radiotherapy. And the main result that we obtain in this study is that the left uh, anterior descending coronary, so this is uh, this coronary artery, the LED coronary mean dose is at least five times the heart mean dose. The second example I would like to, to show it was a study about the influence of the coronary topology on coronary doses. And in this study, we had 22 coronary topologies from real patient data. We constructed the 3D models and we include these uh, topologies in a single thorax and we carried out a calcul um, dose calculation for breast radiotherapy. And we have studied uh, two treatment uh, options, one without internal mammary chain treatment, without and one with internal mammary chain treatment. So you add a field, or you add a beam for the internal mammary chain treatment. And when uh, we carry out the dose calculation, we are able to extract the dose map at the coronary level. And we can see odd spots that appear uh, in some ca cases. And the main conclusion of that study that was that internal mammary chain treatment induces odd spots on the LED. These odd spots they are around 25, 30 grades. But this is not systematic. This happens for some coronary topology, this kind of arch that can be in the beam um, field. So now I would like to show how we have performed uh, cardiac dosimetry uh, with the treatment planning software in the case of the Baccarat study. For the Baccarat study, we directly registered the CCTA to the planning CT scan. And so we have a recipe which is as follows. First, we use the isogray uh, treatment planning system. We select CCTA in best diastole. And then we perform rigid registration of the CCTA, CCTA art on the planning CT scan, uh, the CT scan used for treatment planning. To perform this rigid registration, we need to select fixed points. And uh, then, if needed, we uh, finish we uh, the registration with manual fine adjustment. And at, in the end, we contour the coronaries 
on the registered uh, CCTA. So what is difficult is to select the fixed point to perform the uh, rigid registration. So I have listed a few points that we can use. You can use the bifurcation between the circumflex uh, coronary and the LED. You can guess uh, this bifurcation here. I would say you can see this on about one third, one fourth of the planning CT scan. You can use the center of the aorta when uh, the main and right pulmonary artery join. You can use the heart apex, you can use the liver heart joining as illustrated here. You can also use the sternum tip, even if it's not uh, on the heart, it is useful uh, to obtain the right uh, angulation. And as a result, as it was said by Sophie, we have performed the cardiac dosimetry of substructure for all the patients of the Baccarat study. And here I want to show the ratio of the mean LED dose to the heart mean dose. So this is the ratio of the doses per patient. So we have 89 uh, patients treated for the left side and the mean of the dose ratio is about six with a quite uh, large uh, spreading of the value on a patient basis. So the earlier uh, assessment by, made by Alexandra Moignet was not too false because uh, we we add the number five. There are interesting data, uh, dosimetric data in this court. And for example, I have tried to correlate the odd spot on the LED, that's to say the D2 value, with the odd spot on the heart. And you obtain such a point cloud and I spent many times with a master students about six months to try to find a model for this uh, cloud point. And so you can do something with uh, this part of the, of the plot, but there are patients we did not manage to explain uh, the value of their hotspot hot on the LED based on uh, easier doses that you can obtain easily with the TPS. So it is extremely difficult to predict accurately the hot spots or even the mean dose of the coronaries using only the basic dosimetric data. As a conclusion, I would like to say that I don't think there is currently a gold standard for cardiac substructure dosimetry. Some are using atlases. We are using uh, patient-specific data. I would say that using patient real anatomy avoids attributing a default anatomy. And also, if you have the real anatomy, you can correlate the dose you have calculated with the observation that you have on the real anatomy, if you have effects on a CCTA, for example. However, I don't pretend that uh, using patient-specific data is a holy grail. First, we have a partial visualiz visualization of coronaries even with, with CCTA, after registration, sometimes you don't see all the coronaries. You also have the problem of the registration uncertainties. And I've seen that someone asked about a question about that. We cannot take into account cardiac and respiratory motion. And the last caveat I wanted to add is that 
we are using the TPS, but we have to keep in mind that out of field doses calculated by the TPS are not necessary really um, they come with uncertainty. They come with uncertainty. TPS are very good to calculate uh, the dose to the tumor site or in the field, but out of field, the dose are uncertain. I thank you for your attention. Maybe we have time for a question. I don't know. Um, th thank you very much, Dr. Borgen. Thank you very much for answering the question in the chat. I think. We need to move to the next presentation um, because we've got uh, a bit tired on time. But if there are any more questions in the chat, please do feel free to respond. Um, so let me introduce the next uh, speaker and last for today's uh, webinar, uh, Dr. Monceau, uh, who is a radiation biologist and who is going to talk about molecular mechanisms of the cardiosympathetic system and potentially associated with rhythm disorders in the mouse model. Um, yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Giorgio, for this introduction and thanks for this invitation. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk uh, to you about molecular mechanism of the cardiac sympathetic nervous system, potentially associated with a rhythm disorder in the mouse models after localized ion uh, ionizing radiation. I will start my talk with the background and then uh, with the radiometry project, which is a project about the characterization of the mechanism responsible for radiation-induced rhythm disorders. And finally, I will show you the pre preliminary results of the, this study, especially uh, the impact of uh, whole heart irradiation on the proteins of the cardiac sympathetic nervous system 24 hours post exposure. exposure. Um, first, epidemiological studies have shown that breast cancer patients could develop cardiovascular disease, such as uh, autonomic uh, dysfunction or um, arrhythmia or conductance disorders many years after radiotherapy. More recently, one study shows the distribution of patients with uh, heart problems 10 years after breast cancer. And uh, as you can see uh, in this graph, in, absence, in the absence of radiotherapy treatment, there are no rhythm disorder in this patient group. And uh, another study uh, shows a trend towards increased arrhythmias among uh, hospitalization of patients with a with history of breast cancer treated with radiation therapy. But currently, no study has demonstrated the impact of low to moderate doses on the development of cardiac pathologies by targeting the cardiac sympathetic nervous system. So how does the regulation of the heart by the auto autonomic nervous system? First, uh, we have uh, the sympathetic cardiac nerves, increased heart rate and force of contraction. And uh, in the other hand, we have the parasympathetic innervation of the heart, is partially controlled by the vagus nerve and mediates uh, the lowering of the heart rate. This response on the cardiovascular system is mediated directly via impulses transmitted through the sympathetic nervous system. And this phenomenon is mostly due to catecholamines release. In uh, this uh, radiometry project, uh, our hypothesis uh, is that um, this uh, rhythmias occurring after breast cancer uh, radiotherapy could be the consequence of irradiation focused on uh, small, potentially arrhythmogenic areas of the heart. To answer this question, we have two approaches. An uh, epidemiological and dosimetric approach and a mechanistic experimental approach. 
the first objective uh, of this study is to perform a fine dosimetry of very small areas of the heart, as mentioned uh, Sophie before, example, the atrium or specific nodes responsible for the heartbeat on CT scan of right and left breast cancer patients from Bacara cohort. This part of radiometric project uh, is uh, reali realized in collaboration with Sophie Jacob and David Brojo. And the second part is to identify the mechanism or at the origin of rhythm disorder and their um, uh, signaling pathways. Uh, for the epidemiological and dosimetric approach, uh, we measure the average cumulative dose re received by uh, right atrium, sinoatrial uh, node, and uh, atria ventricular node. On a CT scan between uh, um, 17 uh, left breast cancer patients and 17 right breast cancer patients. On this graph, we observe that the dose received on the right atria and uh, the sinoatrial node is significantly higher in right breast cancer patients than in left breast cancer patients. The difference between left and right patients is still significant, but less marked in atrioventricular nodes um, due to uh, his more central uh, localization. In uh, conclusion uh, of this um, epidemiological and dosimetric approach, uh, it's uh, that the doses rec received by uh, these small areas of the heart are in the range of 0.5 to to gray, and that the radiotherapy using for right, right breast cancer could affect significantly the right atrium and uh, sympathetic nervous system nodes and could induce arrhythmia several years after treatment. In order to get uh, an idea of the molecular pathway responsible for these possible rhythm disorders, we have developed uh, an experimental approach on uh, female uh, mice that will be irradiated with X-rays with the SARP, which is a, an um, irradiation platform for uh, small animals managed by Morgan Dos Santos from LRAC at uh, IRSN. And uh, we have uh, two local irradiation uh, models with the dose from uh, 0.25 uh, to 2 gray. And uh, we have, uh, first we have an irradiation uh, of the whole heart or on uh, irradiation uh, of uh, only 30% uh, of the top of the heart. And in the top of the heart, we can observe the atrium, the atrioventricular node and sinuatrial nodes. Uh, as you can see in this uh, 3D representative image of uh, smooth muscle actin and uh, tyrosine hydroxylase immunolabling, uh, smooth muscle actin uh, is a, a specific marker of vessels and tyrosine hydroxylase is a specific marker of sympathetic nervous system. And um, in this uh, study, uh, cardiac uh, functional parameters, cardiac histology, uh, molecular and serum analysis will be performed at an early uh, stage. Uh, 24 hours after radiation, or at long term, 40 or 60 weeks uh, post exposure. Now, uh, I will show you the preliminary results obtained by Western Blood uh, Analysis 24 hours post. Uh, whole heart exposure, but we have uh, only uh, three animals per group, but we had the significant uh, results. So I show you um, the tyrosine hydroxylase, uh, 
which is a specific marker uh, of the sympathetic nervous system, uh, as you uh, mentioned uh, before. And uh, it's essential protein uh, for the biosynthesis, uh, biosynthesis of catecholamines. And uh, as you can see in this graph, uh, you, you have uh, observed a significant dose uh, dependent increase in atrial part. For synapsin 1, uh, which is a phosphoprotein localized uh, at the presynaptic part and playing an important role in the regulation of neurotransmitter release, uh, we have the same tendency, but it's not significant, but, but the tendency is to an increase in uh, the atrial part of the heart after whole heart irradiation. For another protein as connexin 40, which is a major gap junction of heart responsible for cell to cell conduction, we can see a significant decrease uh, in both heart. Uh, substructure after whole heart irradiation. So in conclusion uh, of uh, this uh, first part, uh, epidemiological and dosimetric approach, uh, we have uh, shown um, that the doses measured in these uh, small areas of the heart range from 0.5 to, to gray and that the, this uh, radiotherapy treatment for uh, right breast cancer could affect significantly the right atrium and sympathetic nervous system nodes, and uh, maybe induced arrhythmia several years after treatment. In perspective, uh, we plan to perform uh, this dosimetry analysis uh, on another cohort that uh, can be followed uh, for at uh, least 10 years to detect the correlation between dosimetry and rhythm disorders developed after radiotherapy. And, for, um, and in conclusion, for the experimental approach, uh, with uh, this uh, preliminary data, uh, we have a remodeling of the cardiac sympathetic system after all heart irradiation. Uh, we have an increase of uh, tyrosine hydroxylase and uh, synapsin one. So maybe uh, we we can have an alteration of the sympathetic nervous system and uh, catecholamine release. And we have a decrease of connexin 40. So maybe uh, it uh, induces uh, the, the disturbance of uh, intercellular conduction. And for this part, uh, we want to perform additional short and long-term analyses on other protein of the cardiac sympathetic nervous system, um, perform the catecholamine assay and follow physiological parameters on long-term groups. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for um, your presentation, Dr. Mansu. Um, very interesting to see that even right, right-sided breast radiotherapy, we should be uh, looking into cardiac toxicity. We, we usually ignore it. Um, we are now five minutes ahead of, uh, um, well, not ahead of your schedule, five minutes later. So I think uh, we can uh, thank our um, presenters for great presentations and really interesting um, results today. Um, and just to give a reminder for uh, our next meeting in October 25th, Rania has posted all the information on the chat um, and to thank ev everyone for attending this meeting. And I hope you enjoyed and you can see again, if you missed something uh, on the um, recording. So th thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, David. Bye-bye, thank you.